Okay, we're starting a new series tonight, the book of Jonah. And we're not even going to turn to the book of Jonah tonight, but we're going to go through it. It's only four chapters. We're going to go through the book of Jonah six times tonight in this class without even turning to it. You say, how are we going to do that? Well, um, we'll show you. Uh, <laughs> okay, I got somebody interested anyways. Okay, in the, in the first chapter of Jonah, we see Jonah running away from God. God had called him to the city of Nineveh. It was a Gentile city. Jonah was a Hebrew prophet. He wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. And apparently that was one of the reasons, or main reason, why he refused to go to the city of Nineveh. So in that first chapter, we see him running away from God. In the second chapter of Jonah, we see Jonah running towards God. When chapter 1 ends, Jonah is swallowed by the whale. And all of chapter 2 takes place in the belly of the whale. And uh, Jonah is running towards God in that second chapter. He's scared to death, and he's crying out unto God. That whole second chapter is his prayer from inside the belly of the whale. In Jonah chapter 3, we see... Jonah running with God. God gives him a second chance. And he's running now with God. He goes into the city of Nineveh, proclaims the word of God. Nineveh repents, and um, God spares the city. In Jonah chapter 4, we see Jonah running without God. Jonah, is, uh, his feelings are hurt. He said 40 days and Nineveh would be destroyed. And they repented, and so God repented also and didn't destroy them. Jonah's feelings were hurt. He, that made him a false prophet in his own eyes. And so he sat outside the city and he pouted and, and sulked, just like a little kid. And so he was running without God. So that's the first, uh, our first um, uh, journey through the book of Jonah. Then so, secondly, we see Jonah as a prophet of God. In chapter 1, we see Jonah as a pursued prophet. God had called him to the city of Nineveh. He refused to go. He ran away, but God didn't leave him alone. Thank the Lord for the good shepherd that goes after the one lost sheep. The 90 and 9 were safe in the fold, but the one sheep that was lost, the shepherd goes after him. Well, here's a case of it. Jonah was the prophet of God, and he's uh, he's being pursued by God. In fact, he gets on board a ship in chapter 1, and he even tells the sailors on that ship that he's running away from God and that God is after him. But, though he ran, God pursued him. In Jonah chapter 2, we see him as a praying prophet. If Jonah ever prayed in his life, it was in Jonah chapter 2. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and that's what you got Jonah doing in chapter 2. He's inside the whale in chapter 2. He's praying like he never has prayed before. So we see him as a praying prophet. In Jonah chapter 3, we see him as a powerful prophet. God gives him a second chance. He goes into the city of Nineveh. He preaches, says that the judgment of God is going to fall upon them if they don't repent. And the whole city, from the king on the throne to the beggar in the street, repent in sackcloth and ashes. And the Bible says that there was 120,000 people there. There may have been much more than that, but it, uh, depending on, uh, on <laughs> who you really want to uh, uh, believe for this, but there was at least 120,000 people in that city that repented, Jonah was a powerful prophet in, in Jonah chapter 3. 120,000 souls. That's amazing. That's way more than Peter experienced on the day of Pentecost. That was only 3,000. Uh, I've been to some Billy Graham meetings over the years. I've seen many, many people come to Christ. Never 120,000 people at one time. This was unheard of. Jonah preached with the power of God. So he was a powerful prophet in Jonah chapter 3. In Jonah chapter 4, he's a pouting prophet. Just like a little kid sticks his lower lip out and sulks and pouts, that's what we see Jonah doing in the fourth chapter of Jonah. He said the city would be destroyed. They repented, so God didn't destroy the city. And Jonah is mad as a hornet. And he goes outside the city and he sits down and he sits there sulking and pouting 
because God did not destroy the city like Jonah had told them that they would be destroyed. So we see him there as a pouting prophet in chapter 4. The next time we want to run through the book of Jonah, we want to see Jonah as a missionary. He was, in every sense of a word, a missionary. He had been sent forth by God. However, in chapter 1, he's a misfit missionary. Did you know that in the book of Jonah, he wins people to the Lord that he's not even trying to win to the Lord? A bunch of sailors on that ship in the midst of that storm. Jonah gives them the word of God and they turn to the Lord. But Jonah was not one bit interested in, those souls of, uh, in the souls of those sailors. Not one bit. He beca- in, instead was more interested in his own situation. He didn't care about those souls. He goes into the city of Nineveh. 120,000 people. He didn't care what happened to them in, uh, uh, for, for all eternity. He, all he was interested in was himself. So we see in chapter 1, he's a misfit missionary. In Jonah chapter 2, he's a miserable missionary. <laughs> he's in the belly of the whale, and he's miserable. He probably one of the worst days of his life. Jonah, if you, if you could have talked to Jonah that day, he probably would have said, I'm not having a very good day. In fact, he didn't have a very good three days because he was in there three days and three nights. And here's Jonah, a miserable missionary. He was miserable not just because he was in the whale. He was miserable because he was out of the will of God. If you're out of the will of God, you're going to be miserable. You may have some happy days for a while, but at the end of the story, you're going to be miserable. Then in Jonah chapter 3, we see him as a mighty missionary. Powerful missionary, mighty missionary. 120,000 get saved through one sermon that he preaches. But in Jonah chapter 4, we see him as a misguided missionary. Now, if Jonah was alive today, do you know what he would be? If Jonah was alive today, he'd be, well, he'd vote for Al Gore for one thing. You say, how do you know that? He's an environmentalist. He's not concerned about the souls of people. He's concerned about a little gourd plant. See, God caused a gourd plant to come out. Jonah's sitting there pouting in the hot sun. God caused a gourd plant to come up and shade Jonah. And then God sent a worm and he destroyed that gourd plant. And so Jonah's back out in the hot sun again. And he's weeping and lamenting, not for the men of Nineveh, but over that little plant. He would have been a tree hugger today if he was alive today. Save the whales, save the rainforest, save the gourd plants. It would have been all, all the, uh, this is where Jonah would, would be coming from. And, um, you know, we have that today. These folks that want to, they want to save and preserve the pristine um, uh, landscape and, and so forth and think nothing of murdering babies. Care nothing about that. But yet, they, it's, it's all the environment. Well, Jonah, I think, must have come into that category. He didn't care about the 120,000 souls that would have gone to hell. He was interested in a little gourd plant. All right, so as we come into the, <coughs> the book of Jonah, the overview of the book of Jonah, we've gone through it three times already. We've got three more times to go. No book in the Bible has fostered so much unbelief as the book of Jonah and with the possible exception of Genesis. Jonah was swallowed by a whale. You really believe that? You really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Well, the Word of God says he was swallowed by a whale. Not only does the Old Testament tell us he was swallowed by a whale, but the Lord Jesus told us that he was swallowed by a whale. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The Lord Jesus said, the book of Jonah is credible. He was in that whale. If you can believe Jesus, you can believe the book of Jonah. And Jesus said, it, said that it was true. Keith Flood Witness to a guy one time. You don't mind me I tell that story, do you? Keith Flood witnessed to a guy. He, Keith is a, is a real soul winner. He's got the gift of soul winning. 
He witnessed to this guy one time, and the guy was, he says, how can you believe the Bible? He says, you believe that stupid story about the, uh, Jonah being swallowed by the whale? And Keith says to him, forget about Jonah, let's talk about your soul. And he began to talk to him and tell him that he was a sinner and that Jesus died for his sin. And the guy accepted uh, the Lord Jesus as his Savior. And Keith took him someplace. Where'd you take him? I took him to church that night. He went forward and the deacon asked him. Okay, he took him to church. He goes forward. The deacon says to him, do you believe the Bible? And he says, I believe it from cover to cover. He says, I even believe that the whale swallowed Jonah. <laughs> and he said, if it said... That Jonah swallowed the whale? I believe that too. <laughs> well, maybe I enhanced it a little in the telling. That's the way I remember it. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it was pretty close, wasn't it? Pretty close. Okay. Oh, since four, oh, okay. Since 4 o'clock, that's when he accepted the Lord. He said, since 4 o'clock this afternoon, I believe every word in that book. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah is a credible book. The Lord Jesus said that it was credible. Now, here's something you may not know. Jonah prophesied two different times. In 2 Kings 14, 25... Jonah prophesied against the Syrian nation. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, but the Syrian nation, different nation altogether, Jonah prophesied against the Syrian nation. And this is when Jeroboam II was king. And 2 Kings 14.25 says that, speaking of Jeroboam, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering in of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. Jonah, the son of Amittai. That's our Jonah, same guy. Now, this happened about 35 years after he had been sent to Nineveh. What went on in Jonah's life in that 35 years between the time we, we leave him pouting outside the city of Nineveh because God didn't destroy it, <clears throat> and this prophecy, we have no idea what happened. But it's, it's good to hear that Jonah, even if it was many, many years later, came back to the Lord and carried on in the work of the Lord. Remember the story of John Mark in the New Testament. John Mark goes with Paul and Barnabas, and, and then he leaves them right in the middle of that missionary journey. And Paul has a fit, and he carries on. He says, we're, we're, on the, we're going on the next missionary journey. He says, I don't want John Mark. Barnabas says, he's a good man. He, he made one mistake. He, 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 he'll be okay this time. Paul says, no way. They get into a big fight, and they split up. And so Barnabas takes Mark, goes one way. Paul takes Silas, he goes the other way. And so we didn't read about John Mark anymore. Near the end of Paul's life, he's, he's writing to, to Timothy. And he says, bring John Mark, for he's profitable unto me in the ministry. God got a hold of that young man, and he did something in his life. Jonah must have been a young man when he went to Nineveh. And he didn't do too well. But here we find him about 35 years later, God has gotten a hold of his life. Okay, um, some other things about in that passage about uh, Jonah we're not going to get into. But we, one thing we learned from that passage, he was of gath Hepher. That was his hometown. 200 years earlier, that was the breeding place of giants. We read, in fact, that is where Goliath was from, and the whole family of Goliath. We've got scripture in your lesson. You can, look, uh, you can look it up at your leisure. But this is where Jonah came from, the land of the giants. And the giants were all dead and gone by the time Jonah was born. But Jonah could have been a giant for God. He could have been a giant if he had just let God get hold of his life. Thank the Lord that God gives people second chances and third chances. Thank God for that. And there's not a one of us here that probably hasn't messed up in some way or other in our lives. But God in his graciousness gives us 
second and third chances. Okay, now, going to the next page there. The name of Jonah, and this is what we want to concentrate on. The name of Jonah. Jonah, the name Jonah, is the Hebrew word for dove. Now it doesn't just mean, the na name Jonah just doesn't mean dove, it is the word for dove. Anytime you read in the Old Testament about a dove, it's the name Jonah. That's what his name means, he is, is a dove. And it's very interesting that the first mention of a dove in the Bible is found back in Genesis chapter 8. Now I'm going to ask you to turn with me, please, to the 8th chapter of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 8, we're going to take our fourth trip now through the book of Jonah. And we're going to see the parallel or the type or the symbol here of the dove as we consider the life of Jonah. And in Genesis chapter 8, verse 8 he says, Also he sent forth a dove. That's what God did in Jonah chapter 1. He sent forth the dove, Jonah. Verse 8 says, He sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. In the word of God, the waters are always symbolic of the masses of Gentile humanity. Waters are sim symbolic of this. In Bible typology and symbology, the waters speak of the masses of, the Gentile, huma of Gentile humanity. Revelation 17, 15, he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. He said the waters there, they symbolize the masses of the Gentiles. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20, he says, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. The Gentile masses seen as the wicked there, as like the troubled sea. In Isaiah chapter 60, and verse 5, this is talking about the millennium. And he says, Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. You say, what is the abundance of the sea? Well, he explains it. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. This is during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, the abundance of the sea, the masses of Gentiles are going to come and be converted unto thee. So, waters are symbolic of the masses of humanity, the Gentile nations. Now, we read here in this verse that he sent forth a dove. And why did the dove go forth? Well, it says in that eighth verse, to see if the waters were abated from off the earth. The waters speak of the Gentiles. Now, if you've got your Bible open to Genesis chapter 8, if you look in verse 3, and the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. See that word right at the end of verse 3, the last word, abated? It's the Hebrew word chasser, and it means just what we would think it would mean, to decrease or lower. The waters decreased, the waters were lowered. No problem with that. But in verse 8, we have the word abated also. You know that word is a completely different word. It's the word kwala, and it means contempt, vile, a curse, and despised. What a strange word to have in that verse. It says the dove was sent forth to see if the waters were contemptible, vile, cursed, and despised, abated. That's what the Jews thought of the Gentiles. That's what Jonah thought about Gentiles. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. It was a Gentile city. <laughs> in his eyes, the Gentiles were contempt, they were vile, they were cursed, and they were despised. Well, in, in Genesis 8.8, 8, we have a picture of Jonah chapter 1. The dove is sent forth to check out the Gentiles, and they are despised in his eyes. All right? In Jonah chapter 2, or I should say uh, in, in the next verse, Genesis 8.9, we have a picture of Jonah chapter 2. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, The dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth, and he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into the ark. In that ninth verse, the dove 
finds no rest. In Jonah chapter 2, he found no rest. He was in the belly of the whale. And that ninth verse tells us that he put forth his hand, this is Noah, and took her and pulled her into the ark. We find the dove, in verse 9, inside the ark. We find God's dove, Jonah, in chapter 2, inside the whale. Inside the ark, there's a wall separating the waters, the masses, from Jonah, uh, from, uh, from the dove. Inside the whale, there is a wall separating the waters from, uh, from Jonah. Now, the ark was built with just one window, and that was up at the top. There was no windows on the side. If, the, if there had been, a, uh, the waters would have got in. And so there was just the one window up at the top. So when it says that Noah went and brought the dove back in, he had to go up to the top of the ark, hold up his hand, and take a hold of the dove when she returned, and bring her into the ark from the top. This is how Jonah got inside the whale, the same way, from the top. The whale came up, and there was, uh, there was Jonah, and uh, down he went into the belly of the whale. The next verse, verse 10, is a picture of Jonah in Jonah chapter 3. Verse 10 says, And he stayed yet other seven days again, and he set forth the dove out of the ark. Should notice that? Again, he sent forth the dove. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Again, he sent forth the dove. The grace of God is seen there. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And so we read in Genesis 8 that Again, he sent forth the dove. Then, verses 11 and 12 give us a picture of Jonah chapter 4. Genesis chapter 8, verse 11 says, And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated, and that's the same word, abated, that means despise, contempt, and so forth. He knew that the waters were abated from off the earth, and he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, Here go, here's the dove is, is sent forth again, but what, watch what happens. The dove was sent forth, which returned not again unto him anymore. The dove was sent forth, but did not return. Did you know that that is totally unnatural behavior for a dove? That, had, that ark had been its home for over a year. And he never returned. That's a picture of Jonah in Jonah chapter 4. He's, the book closes with Jonah sitting outside of the city and arguing with God about the fate of the city, sitting there sulking, feeling sorry for himself. Now not only did, jo uh, did the dove not return to Noah, Jonah never returned to the city of Nineveh again. That was the only message they got from God until 120, 150 years later when the prophet Nahum came in and prophesied against that city. The messenger, Jonah, the dove, he never returned. All right, that's four times through the book of Jonah. And we see the dove there in Genesis chapter 8 paralleling all four chapters of Jonah. Let's go through it a fifth time. And this time we want to see just the characteristics of a dove. The characteristics of the dove as given to us in the Word of God. First of all, in Jeremiah 48 and verse 28, we read that the dove makes a nest. The dove makes a nest. Here is Jonah chapter 1 in type. The dove makes a nest. And uh, we read it in Jeremiah 48, verse 28. He says that he would be like the dove that maketh her nest in the sides of the hole's mouth. He's talking about there in the rocks. Up in the rocks, if there's a hole in the rock, he says the dove will go in and build a nest inside that, uh, that rock. Now notice uh, that he says they're in the sides of the hole's mouth. In Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah in a nest that he made, not in the sides of a rock, but 
Jonah 1.5 says, in the sides of the ship. He goes down into the hold of the ship, down there where the cargo was, and it says Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. He built his nest in the midst of a storm, and he knew why the storm was happening. He told the sailors why that storm was happening like it was. They, he, he knew perfectly well, was because he was out of the will of God, and God was pursuing him. But like a lot of Christians, he slept, he made his nest, and he slept. Did you know in the 13th chapter of Matthew, when Jesus gave the parable of the wheat and the tares, it says they went and they planted the good seed, the wheat, and then it says, but while men slept, the tares were planted. While men slept, church members were sound asleep, and uh, the enemy came in, and they planted tares. And the tares looked just like the wheat. They looked like wheat, they acted like wheat, and so forth, but they were tares. And the reason they got in is because men slept. Well, here's Jonah sleeping now. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray. What did they do? They slept. He said, could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? So in Jonah chapter 1, we see a nesting dove. In Jonah chapter 2, we see a mourning dove. In Isaiah 38, verse 14, he says, I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward, O God, I am oppressed, undertake for me. That's basically what, jo what Jonah said in Jonah chapter 2. He, in Jonah chapter 2, he's a mourning dove. He's mourning, he's crying unto God. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 says, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. He was mourning, he was lamenting his condition there. So we see chapter 1, the nesting dove, chapter 2, the mourning dove, and in Jonah chapter 3, we find the harmless dove. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Did you know a dove can't hurt anything no, you don't have to fear anything from a dove. A dove lives in fear of predators. It, it has no protection. Doesn't he have a long, sharp beak like a woodpecker or a blue jay or, or something like that? Doesn't have any, any great weapons that it uh, can use. It's, uh, it's a harmless animal. Jesus said, he said, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as a dove. When Jonah went into the city of Nineveh, in Jonah chapter 3, he says, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. It never happened. He said, 40 days and the judgment of God is going to fall upon this city. It never happened. He said that God is going to judge you people. And he had no love for them. They were Gentiles. They were Gentiles who were despised and uh, all of the other things that word abate meant. He cared nothing for their souls, but he said, this is what's going to happen to you. And lo and behold, Jonah 3.10 says that God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them and he did it not. Jonah was harmless. He went into that city with a message of the judgment of God, but it never came because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So we see him as a nesting dove, chapter 1, a mourning dove, chapter 2, a harmless dove, chapter 3, and then in chapter 4, he's a silly dove. In Hosea chapter 7, verse 11, Scripture says, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without a heart. A silly dove without a heart. Here's Jonah in chapter 4. He's a silly dove without a heart. His priorities are all mixed up. He has tenderness and compassion towards a gourd plant and cares nothing about the 120,000 souls that were in there in the city. 
He had no heart. He's a silly dove without a heart as far as the people of Assyria was concerned. Jonah would have been perfectly happy if God would have zapped the city. That would have made him happy. If fire and brimstone would have come down from heaven, Jonah, uh, Jonah would, have, would have felt justified then. But here he's lamenting over a gourd plant that a worm got into and it ate. He's a silly dove without a heart. And so uh, God and Jonah get into an argument. And in Jonah chapter 4, God says to him, Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, where in are more than six, thousand, uh, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? The scripture says that that whole city repented from the beggar on the street to the king on his throne. And God says here, more than six score thousand persons. That's the last verse in the book of Jonah. Well, that's 120,000 people. God says there's more than 120,000 people. Some believe that that's talking about just infants and young children because it says they cannot discern between their right hand and, they, and their left. Some have suggested that this city was probably about 600,000 people. We don't know. We we'll just take what, uh, what's written in the Word of God and not try to add to it. Uh, God says there was over 120,000 people in that city. I personally, I think that that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand is talking about their spiritual condition. They were just spiritually blind. They had no knowledge of the truth and so forth. But and then in Jonah 4.1, it says it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Why was he angry? You know, I'm, any preacher I know that if he preached a message and you had a even one or two people come and accept the Lord. You'd be happy about it, right? Here's a, probably one of the greatest uh, results of preaching that ever happened, one, uh, from results of one single message. Over 120,000 people get right with God, and the preacher that preached the message is angry. It says he, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. So God deals with him. And in Jonah chapter 4 verse 9, God said to Jonah, dost, dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. <laughs> I'm going to stay angry even if you kill me. I'm going to stay angry till the day I die. I'm never going to be sorry about this city again. Lord, you let me down. You made me look like a fool. I told these people the judgment of God was coming in 40 days, and 40 days has come and gone. It hasn't, it hasn't happened. They're still here, the city's still here, and I'm still here. He says, so, till the day I die, I'm, I'm going to be angry. Well, you can see why he was a silly dove without a heart. Let's go through the book one more time before we close. The sixth time. And all we have to do is look at the life of doves as found in the scripture. And again, we see the parable of Jonah, the dove. Okay? In Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah fleeing. And here's a verse we already looked at, Genesis chapter 8, verse 12. He says, He stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. The dove fled. Doves are supposed to return home. They're supposed to be a homing animal. He doesn't do it. So we see Jonah in, in chapter 1 fleeing. In Jonah chapter 2, we see Jonah as a type of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 39 and 40, he said that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was a type of Christ. When Jesus was teaching about the resurrection, that he was going to be in the grave for th three days and three nights, he used Jonah as a prototype. He says, just like Jonah, so will I be for three days and three nights. So to begin with in chapter 2, he's a type of Christ. But in addition to that, two times in Jesus' ministry, once at the start of his earthly ministry, and once at the end of his earthly ministry, he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers out of the temple. 
Now, in both those instances, we got them here for you in the notes, Mark chapter 11 and John chapter 2. John chapter 2 was early in his ministry. Mark chapter 11 was late, much later in his ministry. It says that those that he drove out of the temple with the money changers and those, look at the end of uh, uh, Mark eleven fifteen, them that sold doves. And then we read it in John chapter 2, those that sold oxen, sheep, and doves. Why were they selling doves in the temple? Obviously, they were to be offered in sacrifice. Jo Jonah was a type of Christ. The doves, and remember his name means dove, the doves were sold as a sacrifice for sin. In the book of Zechariah chapter 11, there's a prophecy of Christ. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potters, a goodly price that I was uh, pri priced of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. The prophecy was that, like the doves that were sold in the temple, the Lord Jesus would be sold, and the, the price is given, 30 pieces of silver. That scripture was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 26. And one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went into the chief priests, and said unto them, What will you give me? I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, like the doves that were sold in the temple. So Jonah became a type of Christ. He was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and the dove was, was a symbol of something that was sold even as the Lord Jesus was sold. Then in Jonah chapter 3, we read that when Jonah went into the city of Nineveh, he brought with him conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts of sin. You can preach the best gospel message in the world, but if the Spirit of God is not there ministering, it's going to fall on deaf ears. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. Well, the Word of God tells us, Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. They were brought under conviction. Why was that? Because Jonah was a dove. And a dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We read about four times in the New Testament. It's, and here's Luke 3.22. The Holy Spirit ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. And then we read in John 1.32. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. It's the Spirit of God that brings conviction. And the Spirit of God is pictured as a dove. Well, Jonah went in and he brought conviction because he was a type here of the Holy Spirit. Not only was he a type of the Lord Jesus but he was in chapter 2, but he was a type of the Holy Spirit in chapter 3. Genesis chapter 6, God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. He's not always going to strive with man. The Spirit of God can convict you of sin, convict you that you need Christ, convict you of the life that you may be li li living, and if you don't listen to the voice of God and to the Word of God, there's a day that will come when God's Spirit is not going to strive with you anymore. And you won't be under conviction anymore. You won't feel guilty about your sin anymore. You can sin with impunity after that. doesn't make any difference. Well, Jonah here, his presence brought conviction of sin upon the people. A dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Jonah chapter 4. In Jonah chapter 4, Jonah's out of place. Instead of inside the city rejoicing with those new converts, he's sitting outside the city sulking and pouting. He was in the wrong place. Psalm 68, 13 says, Though you have lion among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove. The word pots there means a two-pronged hook that was used for flaying cattle. That's no place for a dove to be laying. The dove laying amongst the pots would be completely out of place. Jonah 
in the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah was completely out of place. He was someplace where he didn't belong. Sitting out there sulking and pouting. Jonah 4, 4 verses 4 and 5 says, Then said the Lord, Dost, dost thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Notice he came, and came out and he sat on the east side of the city. And as we've said many times in the Bible, east is always symbolic of going away from God. And west is always symbolic of going towards God. And that symbolism carries through both Old Testament and New Testament. We put some of the uh, verses in the notes for you. I'm not going to go through them all again. But in Genesis 3, when man left the Garden of Eden, he went away from God. He went out on the east side of Eden. In, G in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain it says he went out from the presence of the Lord, he also went east of Eden. Genesis chapter 13, when Lot wound up in Sodom, it says he journeyed east, journeyed east and wound up in Sodom. And uh, uh, we have all kinds of references to the east. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 16, we find these, um, uh, we find these 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, their faces towards the east, and they're worshiping the sun towards the east. Their backs were to, to the temple. The temple represented the presence of God. They had their backs to the temple and were worshiping to the east. In Matthew chapter 2, the wise men come from the east. They journey west. Why were they journeying west? Because they were going towards God. They were coming towards uh, the baby Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man, uh, of the Son of Man be. Uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8, it said he had Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. Hai means ruin. Bethel means the house of God. He had the house of God on one side and Hai on the east side. The Apostle Paul's forbidden to go eastward with the gospel. The man of Macedonia calls him and says, come and help us. And God sends him westward and change the history of the entire world as he did so. The last two pages that you have there, one is a diagram of the tabernacle in the wilderness. The other is a diagram of the temple in Solomon's time. The tabernacle in the wilderness was always set up so that the door faced the east. So when you went in to the tabernacle, you were going west, you were going towards God. When you left the tabernacle, you were going east, you were going away from God. The temple was built the same way. That tabernacle had to be set up every, every day, every night, it had to be set up, taken down, they traveled, and for 40 years this went on, it was always set up the same way. The door had to always face the east. The tabernacle, uh, I'm sorry, the temple that Solomon built, the, the, the uh, door was towards the east. Going in, you're going west, towards God. Coming out, you're going east, away from God. Well, here we find Jonah sitting on the east side of the city. Very symbolic of the fact Jonah was away from God. He was a dove that was out of place. So that's six trips through the book of Jonah, and we didn't even open the book. Next week, we're going to start. This was an overview of Jonah. Next week, we're going to start with chapter 1, and we're going to see Jonah running away from God. We're going to see Jonah, the pursued prophet. We're going to see Jonah, the misfit missionary. Let's look to God in prayer. We'll be dismissed. Loving Father, we do thank and praise you now for your presence with us tonight. And we pray that the lessons we can learn from Jonah, we might practically apply to our own lives. Lord, help us to be sensitive to your leading in our life. And when we do know the will of God, not to run from it as Jonah did. And Lord, we're so thankful for both the second chance you gave Jonah, and then somewhere along the line you apparently gave him a third chance. Because we see him all those years later prophesying against the nation of Syria. So Lord, we do pray that we might always be sensitive in the direction that you lead. Now dismiss us with your blessing upon us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.